Hello again. My log has something to tell you. Can you hear it? I will translate. Sometimes environmentalists, like NIMBYs, jump up and say no. Regulation is not all that it seems. Beware the flimsy lawsuit. <laughs> Welcome back to Pop Culture Urbanism, where we look at the cities behind movies, TV shows, video games, and more. I'm your host, Nolan Gray. Today we're looking at Twin Peaks, the cult classic TV show from Mark Frost and David Lynch. I would say spoiler alert here, but the show turned 30 last year, and I think the statute of limitations on spoilers has long expired. Now Nolan, why are we talking about Twin Peaks? It's set in a small logging town. Au contraire, there's urbanism all around us, and perhaps more than any other modern TV show, Twin Peaks understands the dark motivations behind nimbyism and how it can often corrupt environmental causes. In classic David Lynch style, we're forced to look beneath the surface at the dark underbelly of how land development politics actually works, even in cases that might seem black and white. Now, Twin Peaks is superficially a show about one question. Who killed Laura Palmer? Is this about Laura? murder of Laura Palmer. I heard you speaking about Laura Palmer. Okay, let's talk about Laura. But that's really just a pretext for the showrunners to explore everything from the social dynamics of small town life to the heavily caffeinated personal philosophy of Special Agent Dale Cooper. And wouldn't you know it, Twin Peaks even has its own evil developer antagonist. I'm of course talking about Ben Horn. He's the town's resident rich guy. He owns the town's hotel, which acts as a kind of de facto town hall. He also owns Twin Peaks' department store, we find out later that he actually owns a brothel slash casino up in Canada, and he recruits its prostitutes from girls who work at the department store. Yes, he's a bona fide evil developer. But Ben Horn is also kind of weird. At some points in the show he's the evil developer, but at other points in the show he's the anti-developer. In season one he actually conspires to burn down the Twin Peaks logging mill to get the land for cheap and develop it into the Ghostwood Estates and Country Club. He even kills his extramarital affair, Catherine, in an attempt to tie up loose ends. This is classic evil developer stuff. But in season two, we find out Catherine is not dead. She disguises herself as a Japanese businessman. It's as weird as it sounds. And she tricks Ben Horn into signing the development over to her through her conniving chicanery. And here's where things get interesting for us urbanist enthusiasts. Once Ben Horn loses control of the project, he mounts an environmental crusade against it because it could threaten the imperiled pine weasel. I give you a little pine weasel found only in our tri-county area. It is nearly extinct. They're incredible roasted. <clears throat> According to an environmental impact report, what few pine weasels remain will be all but wiped out with the Packard plans for Ghostwood development. And though the residents of Twin Peaks seem to buy it, it's obvious to those of us in the audience that Ben Horn is only taking on the environmentalist moniker to kill a project that's no longer in his financial interests. At this point in the video, let's establish one thing. Are all environmentalist evil developers trying to crush their competition? No, of course not. And this video isn't even anti-environmental protection or environmental regulation. This video is, however, looking beyond just the stated intentions of policy. True to Lynch's storytelling, there's a primal evil lurking below the innocuous surface here, both in terms of environmental policy and with folks like Ben Horn. To fight this ghostwood development on every ground and with every available weapon. Now it's around this time that the show's original run abruptly ends. But in The Secret History of Twin Peaks, which I'm sure all of you as Die Hard fans have read, we find out that Ben Horn actually succeeds in killing the Ghostwood Project. He eventually takes control of the site back from Catherine Martell, and of course does a 180 on his environmental crusade, ultimately developing the Ghostwood Estates. The fate of the Pine Weasel remains one of Twin Peaks' great unsolved mysteries. <laughs>
Now it's easy to write off Ben Horn's faux environmentalist charge as the cynical final act of a defeated character, with all the surrealism we've come to expect from the show. But if you've spent much time in the world of urban planning or development, you know that stories like this play out all the time. In California, for example, they have the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA, which requires that cities review the environmental impacts of any proposed development. But what it also does is it allows third parties to sue local governments for allowing any new development if they feel that certain environmental impacts weren't sufficiently studied. Sounds great, right? But as an unintended consequence, this law allows anyone who wants to stop a development to file endless environmental lawsuits, laddening the project with legal fees and months and months or even years of delays. And just the threat is often enough to stop a lot of small developers from trying to build anything. And for projects that do get through this process, they're gonna be extra expensive, both because they have less competition and also because they had to take on all those legal fees and delays, which can get pretty expensive. It's estimated that California needs to build about 200,000 housing units every year just to keep up with population growth. Unfortunately, for the past 10 years, the state's only added about 100,000 new units every year. And this type of environmental litigation is a big part of that shortage. Now, Nolan, shouldn't this just be the cost of protecting the environment? Eh, no. We already have environmental regulations for things like pollution or protected wetlands and forests or protecting endangered species like, I don't know, the pine weasel. A lot of the projects that actually get killed by things like CEQA lawsuits are, in many cases, infill developments trying to build within existing urban areas, like building an apartment building on a vacant lot or revamping an old building. These aren't exactly things that are killing off pine weasels. The real tell here is who's filing these lawsuits. One study of CEQA lawsuits from 2010 to 2012 found that 85% were filed by organizations that had no history whatsoever of environmental advocacy. We're talking about labor unions who want to stop a non-union project, or neighborhood associations who just want to stop growth in their communities, or yes, even in some cases, developers who want to kill off the competition. So we block Catherine's development until the wheel turns and we get another shot. That's brilliant, Ben. And as easy as it is to beat up on California these days, it's not just a California thing either. New York City has its own equivalent, Seeker, which is often used and abused in the same way. Similar environmental opposition to new development unfolds over and over again all over the country, sometimes even with the support of national environmental groups that really should know better. Ironically, all of this pushes new housing and office space further and further out of town, where it's less likely to be broadsided by environmental litigation. All of this sprawling new development is gonna consume agricultural land, and because it's so spread out, more people will have to drive, ultimately leaving us with less open space and more pollution. So let's take a step back. The choice here isn't really between development or no development. The choice here is between either letting developers build in existing urban areas or letting people sue them on behalf of the environment, thereby forcing more and more development out of town where it might actually threaten pine weasels. I want Twin Peaks to remain unspoiled in an era of vast environmental carnage. Now, Nolan, baby, I love you, but you're the host of a show connecting cities to pop culture. Don't you think that these writers are just trying to come up with an extreme evildoer? It's not indicative of the real world. Now, yes, I will grant you, most people fighting development are not brothel owners who are also trying to kill their extramarital lovers. But all of these environmental and anti-development laws might not be as selfless as they seem. I am absolutely 100% sincere. Consider that much of the modern environmental movement began in the 1970s when baby boomers were moving out to the suburbs en masse. And then, as other people join them in the middle class, they watch and whore as new development crowds out the nature that they were once able to enjoy. Many of these new suburbanites sought out environmental groups who shared their opposition to this new development, conveniently ignoring that their own homes were built on what was once natural open space. You damn hypocrites make me sick! At the same time, demand for housing in America was exploding. The high inflation of the 1970s combined with favorable federal tax policies give us the idea that a home is an investment, a place where you should park your life savings. If you could find a way to constrain housing supply in a context of growing demand, you would really increase the value of your own property. 
This isn't to say that the goals and ideals of environmentalism or leaving a nest egg to your children aren't good and honest, but where their interests intersect is something that can be abused and exploited, as we see with someone like Ben Horn. He can rally his business partners to join hands with environmentalists to stop the Ghostwood Development Project, duping a lot of well-meaning people along the way. And this is very similar to the real world, where environmentalists and financially focused homeowners come together to support the politicians who will give them policies they can both agree on. It's for this reason that the CEQA law discussed earlier was passed by none other than then-Governor Ronald Reagan. Then, I am considering a run for the Senate. Ben Horn is an evil developer, through and through. But what's so special about his character is that he fulfills his evilness by ultimately becoming an anti-developer. It's a subtle stroke of urbanist brilliance that showrunners Mark Frost and David Lynch have given us. And seeing how well it fits into the show, it says a lot about the absurdity of American land use politics. So the next time that somebody in your community is making a passion plea against new housing, ask yourself, who's the real weasel being protected? That's all for today's episode of Pop Culture Urbanism. If you don't want us to go off air for 25 years, be sure to hit the like button. And if you know who killed Laura Palmer, let us know in the comments below. And my log would like to tell you something. You should also subscribe and hit the bell for notifications.